Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is, once again, the world's leading expert on Southern food, the writer John T. Edge. Edge has written innumerable columns for the New York Times, the Oxford American, and Garden and Gun, and is the author of a shelf of books on Southern food. Most recently, The Potlicker Papers, The Modern South Examined, Explained Through Food and Cooks. I spoke with John T. Edge in Studio UA in the Digital Media Center on the campus of the University of Alabama. Auntie, thank you for coming back. My pleasure. <laughs> you're very generous to give us so much of your time. I know you're, you're having a very busy day. Um, they, they're working me hard and being kind to me at the same time. It's the way I love to live. And later you're going to lecture some more. Well, I'll, I'll just exhaust you for another 25 minutes and then, and then we'll let you go. One of, the, one of the things that I was amused by, and call, call this, a, it's not even a controversy, but, I, but it tickled me anyway. There's a good deal of talk about ingredients, mm -hmm. heirloom tomatoes, uh, resurrecting a, a certain, uh, certain brands of swine and right. so on. And then you, <laughs> and there was, well, one of the guy was, one of the, pe one of the people who came out on this other side was Pappy from the Bourbon Company, <laughs> who said, it's just corn. It's right. all about the skill. Right. There's the subject for you. Yeah. On the one hand, there's a, these devoted, evangelical people who say, it's the ingredients. Right. And then the other people who say, no, you gotta, have, you got to know what you're doing. No, and I remember a, a very hubristic argument on my part with Frank Stitt one time I had of Highlands Bar and Grill in Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. And he was making the ingredient um, argument, and he was talking about, you know, Coleman strawberries or sweet potatoes or something. I think it was sweet potatoes. And, and I was making the argument that it's about labor. It's about the muscle memory of the cook, not the quality of the ingredients. And I was saying, I probably said something as ridiculous as, well, it's, you know, you could take canned greens, and if you had a really talented cook, those greens would be as good as the fresh cut greens you might cook, Frank. I, I thought I would pour it on heavy. Um, I've since come around more to his way of thinking. I recognize the import of ingredients. The thing that I resist, and I think was embedded in my resistance yeah. in my conversation with Frank, is the exclusivity by which we deliver those fancy pants ingredients. Those, those not fancy pants, those, those better quality ingredients. They're too expensive. They're, and or who industrial is going foods to get to eat cheap. them? One it, of the two. I mean, if, if, from a kind of a... a <laughs> What a egalitarian point of view, who gets to eat the heirloom tomato that costs four dollars for one tomato? Well, I mean, you know, that could be fixed by policy within um, federal ranks and state ranks that would help us drive um, good local quality food down in price and help us um, re recognize the amount of subsidies that make industrial food so cheap. It, it's, it's interesting in a way that. Americans can get pretty, ag no, not agitated enough, but somewhat agitated mm -hmm. over, over the extinction of a bird or a snail darter or, a, or what have you. But, but Americans don't seem to generate the same emotional pitch when it comes, there used to be, I don't know, one makes these things up, a hundred kinds of corn <laughs> or a or hundred kinds of tomatoes or what have you, and now we've lost huge percentage of you it. You don't know yes. my friends. My friends get pretty ag agitated about that, uh, oh, right. about the loss of those ingredients and the loss of, you know, the possibilities within those yeah, ingredients, yeah. perhaps for medicinal purposes um, yeah, right. and other. I think about my great friend Janice Ray, who wrote that fabulous yes. book, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood. You know, Janice is at our Southern Foodways Symposium this year giving a talk yes, about she. climate change and loss. Um, and it's a pretty bleak talk. Um, it ends on hope um, based on some work done by a woman named Ira Wallace at the Southern Seed Exchange in Virginia who was using um, West African variety plants um, in a new way 
in the hills of Virginia linking Africa past to Africa present. Right. Um, there's hope, but there's also bleakness. And I think within the world of food and especially ecologically minded people like Janice, there's a lot of agitation. We, we, yeah. will, we would have to, if we're going to promote, if we're going to get farmers to raise almost extinct varieties of whatever, right. corn or tomatoes or peaches or whatever, we're going to have to figure out a way to pay them. Well, and it's, you know, these varieties that we have now that are, that are part of our grocery store purchases were, were developed for hardiness, for transport, oh, yeah. um, to be picked green and, and then mature by way of being gassed or manipulated in some way. So those old varieties are not just the fetish of having the heirloom, it's gaining a lost taste. And people like Janice, people like David Shields at the University of South Carolina, um, are doing really generous work that is not grounded in elitism, but the mechanisms of society make it difficult to afford such things. In one way or another, let's talk about money for a little bit. There, sure. there are two ways I want to talk about money. One, one way is, or maybe more than two, but I have read recently that in America today, well, let's say in America in 1950, the average family spent about 11, 12 percent of its income on food. Now, this very red hot minute, the average American family, I think I've read, spends about 6 percent of its income on food. First question, does that seem low to you? You know, it seems, I, I am not um, a deeply knowledgeable person about such things, but that does not surprise me, no. It's low. But people, people think they're paying a lot for food, but they're not. Right. And, and the, what we're, <clears throat> the cost to, to us all of keeping the prices that low right. is that we're, we are injuring crops, farmers, soil, all of it. And you've, you've written it's a legacy of that moment I write about in the book of yeah. Earl Butts, um, oh. you know, who was the ag oh. secretary you know, whose mantra was get big or get out. You know, this notion that if the Green Revolution was going to make possible, you know, for not only America to feed itself as cheaply as possible, but for America to feed the world. And we went for industrial ag in a, in a big way. And we drove down prices, we drove down quality. Um, we, we also made for unsafe working conditions. You know, I write about in the book that, you know, in, in, there was virtual slavery in the tomato fields of, of Florida, you know, in the Let's stick with late that 20th for a century. Bit. The 20, the, they were being paid X pennies per, they were picking and being paid by the pound. Piece rate, like you get yeah. paid by the amount of tomatoes you pick, which yes. sounds, you know, which has ugly echoes of cotton picking sure. past. And the, when they increased the so, pay. Yeah, so the, the campaign, this um, group I admire a lot, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Florida, you know, and they point out, like, I'm talking about a southern solution to an American problem with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So they figured out that instead of putting pressure um, on consumers to spend more money for food, which is not really a, a winning proposition, they put pressure on grocery stores, they put pressure on retailers, they put pressure on Burger King and Taco Bell and the like. Um, and the pressure was that if you'll just pay through the, through the system of labor, if you'll just pay these pickers who are picking um, these tomatoes, you just pay them one more penny a pound, they can come up out of abject poverty into a living wage. Would you be willing to pay a penny more pound for this, this, this tomato on your Taco Supremo or whatever the heck the thing is? Yeah. And when, it it gets, and when it gets to our taco, a terrible idea that is, but anyway, by the time it gets to our plate, it, the, the increase for the worker was profound, changed his life. And the, and but the, the impact in, upon our budget was nil. But the effect on us is, you know, a lot of reading I've been doing recently suggests that all the money in food is after the farmer. <laughs> Right. And before us, it's truckers and banks and and Walmart and wholesalers and it's transportation. It's also value add. So you raise, um, you know, you raise 
collard greens and you're not getting too much for a bag of collards. But once you puree those collards and turn them into a casserole and sell that, you know, in the frozen food section at Walmart by adding value to that crop, then you are actually able to make the bank. I, I think if Americans understood that paying, instead of paying five or six percent of their income for food, they paid eight percent, and that it would change lives all down the line, I think people would do it. I think you're right. I, well, How do you, I don't know. I want to believe you're right, and, and I want to believe that to be true. Mm. Um, I'm a little cynical about that. I think what is interesting in terms of wages and, and Americans and Southerners confronting underpaid people, what's happening in restaurants right now is fascinating. You know, the notion that, you know, restaurants are having a really hard time rehiring after the pandemic yes. um, because working conditions were, were really rough. Pay was way too low. So these, you know, the absent restaurant workers, the answer to that is to pay them um, a better wage, yes. um, treat them better, um, recognize that, especially in the South, like we have a history of devaluing food because food's been the thing that black people did, people of color did. Food's been the thing that women did. So we have this burden upon ourselves to make good on um, our previous heirs. And uh, let's, let's... You have a line in there somewhere that says, Southerners don't know how to tip. Did I say that? Yes. yes. I think you know, I quoted somebody saying that. You I quoted somebody you, saying that. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. But, um, it, 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 but it, it was, that was that was Goran Avery, I believe, from <laughs> Highlands Bar and Grill in Birmingham <laughs> saying that and when he was coming up in the restaurant business in Birmingham, like Southerners didn't know how to tip. They were not accustomed to dining out and you know, if you were of the gentry in Birmingham, you ate at the club. Right? That's right, yes, yes. Or a country club or the club. The club, right. But what's, dog taught them how to tip. <laughs> what is, what's an appropriate tip right this minute? Um, I tip 30 to 35%. Do you? Yeah. Ooh. 35 may be a stretch. I, st I tip 30%. Oh, you're, that's, I, 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 I'm, I find that very generous. I, I, I do it because um, <laughs> yeah. I recognize this is a really tough moment for people, and I care about uh -huh, people in the world uh -huh. of food. Yeah. Um, and I can afford to do that. All and right. It, it comes back to your idea. Like, if you're if you're, if we're only paying spending six percent for food, right. you know, go for thirty. All right. In b b both of your books, the Southern Belly and Pot Liquor Papers, there are sections that have to do with fine dining, <laughs> and they're really wonderful because they go all over the place. In my opinion, they go yeah. all over the place. Yeah. We we admire to the point of reverence. Yeah the Frank Stitz of the world, who have done something fantastic. But there, is a, there are lines in your book that say the era of fine dining is over. And how, I explain, I mean, this, sure. is, this is your I mean, subject. Well, no, but I think, you know. These things come, all true at the same time. This comes back to something you and I talked about in the previous show about, you know, the rise of a kind of pride in the South um, and the rise of explanations of the South linked to literature and linked to food. And so I think one of the reasons people revere Frank Stitt um, is because he's married to Partis, but also because Frank, um, you know, showed us a South we might not have seen before. He instilled pride in people of Alabama in their crops and their fish. Um, he built a restaurant where this gentleman I mentioned a moment ago, Red Dog, Goran Red Dog Avery, is the king of that dining room uh -huh. where a black man who's been waiting tables there since 1982 is the person I seek out. I, I don't, I mean, I love seeing Frank. Um, I always want to see Partis. I always want to see Frank. But when I go to Highlands, Red Dog is the person who makes my experience. And so he built a restaurant that, 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 changed how we as Southerners see restaurants. And I think that's really important. Yeah, and, and in, in what normally we might think of as a French tradition, there right. are some waiters who really know what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, you see that in New Orleans. Um, yeah. Oh, you absolutely. You see that in Highlands. Yeah. Absolutely. A, 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 few, a while back, my wife and I were eating at Highlands, and she had Osobuco, mm -hmm. and she was kind of staring at the bone and the waiter showed up with the marrow knife. 
Right. And he just saw the he just saw the eye tracking toward the bone. I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it was in a millennium. Yeah. But it happened that's there. Beautiful. Yeah. That, yeah. That that was that that's uh, remarkable that he knew that there was a customer who would, would yeah. eat the marrow and, and that anticipatory and, service is, uh, is you uh, know you mentioned a moment ago about fine dining you know subsiding and I think it is well, but there are those why. moments when it matters yeah. I mean yeah it's wonderful it's, as a special occasion it can't be beat it's wonderful right. w- why soul food rises and falls and and uh, you know all all I guess everything rises and falls sure. but fine dining seems to have tapered down right I, I think there is um, you know, there's this, this phrase I love. There's a woman named Dana Cowan who was the editor of Food & Wine magazine for a while. And she talked about luxocratic food. And I love that term. I don't know it. Um, it, it is her term, and it's food that is both luxurious and democratic, small d democratic. And, okay. and I think that's where we're heading. Good food without pretense. Good food that's grounded in place, it's grounded in narrative, but does not require a white tablecloth. Uh-huh. And, and that's the way I like to eat. I love a night out at Highlands, but I also love one of my favorite restaurants on the planet is Johnny's in Birmingham. Um, have you ever been there? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, you know, it's a Greek and three, a, yes. a meat and three run by yeah. a Greek wild man named Tim Hansis. He uses some of the same suppliers that Frank and Partis do at Highlands. Um, and, and his quality of food, like the, the, the kefteres, his Greek meatballs with tzatziki, his fried green tomatoes, like the chicken pot pie, it is remarkably good food, but it is without pretense. <laughs> only, only uh, my mother is Greek. It's only in Birmingham do you find a plate that has domades and fried green tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you think, this is really something. Well, and you think about the barbecue tradition in in, in Birmingham and in, in... And Jim and Nick's is Greek Jim as and well. Jim and Nick's, Nick Pahakas. Well, the, one of them is. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's, they both are? It's, it was, so Jim and Nick were Nick and his father. Right. Ah, right. I, I recently read a, a history of the Bright Star. They've yeah. been, uh, they wrote up a the family wrote up the history of the restaurant. Fifty years, I guess. Oh, ni- long, nineteen? So no, over a hundred. Hundred years. years, yeah. Um, that that restaurant, as a marker of immigrant influence, you know, um, and Bessemer as a former steel town that would have attracted new immigrants. You know, you could tell the whole arc of modern Alabama by starting with the Best Star, Best. I mean, with Bright Star. Yeah. Well, there there would be. Um, a lot less good food in Birmingham if it weren't if it weren't for the island island of Lesbos from which they all came. <laughs> I, I um you know I'd like hot dogs a lot less. Put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Down in Mobile, it's the kingdom of monkeys. Eugene was a good friend. Sweet Lunacy's County Seat. Yes. <laughs> and your you once well you actually have, you have a little some sections about mm-hmm. Eugene and so on. I knew. Oh, I only knew him as, after he came back in '79 from from uh, from, Rome. from Rome, where yeah. he'd been for <laughs> 20 years and so on. And we had a few meals at his house, but wow. they were not in the in the cat-free room. No, in the dining room. Oh, okay. Well, I can actually tell you a little thing about the dining room. Is he had you know he had to eat cats, and um, one one evening we were sitting in the living room, the little living room. You've been there. No, no I, there's I, a little I, living room, and then yeah, there's the cat free room is clo- closed off, and there's a little living room where the cats are free to roam, and then right. the cats were free to roam in the kitchen and in the dining room, this tiny hello house, tiny dining room, and yeah. we went in to eat, and there was a, a kind of leprous cat lying on my plate, and I thought, oh my God, what? And Eugene didn't say a word to me about, I'm awfully sorry there's a leprous cat on your plate. He said, oh. And this cat is so tired, and he lifted the cat up very gently and took the cat away. <laughs> and then, then we ate on the plate, which yeah. was, which was. He he was a more important a cookbook writer and a more important writer about food than I knew at the time. Yeah, the Time Life was a big deal. Yeah, you, when he wrote that Time Life book, um, which was part of that whole series, yeah. it was a book on France, it was a book on, in, in the Americas, the book on Cajun and Creole. Um, you know, he took off with a, if I remember, a Czechoslovakian guy who drove him around in a station wagon, like he did the work on the road to write that book. 
um, I, what was the phrase? He, he recorded someone saying, watery grits go with sleazy ways. Um, <laughs> I remember that line and I loved it so wonderful. much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, his curiosity about food and his recognition that there was meaning embedded in food um, really, really um, resonated with me as I began to think about food culture. Um, we commissioned a, um, a song cycle about Eugene a few years back um, by a guy named Paul Birch. Um, it's called Trovatore, and um, it's a cycle of six songs about Eugene and his life. And, and uh, I'm a kind of a Eugene obsessive. We have, oh. we have one cat at home, and you already know his name. Is it Eugene Walter? It's Eugene Walter, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, he had cats. And there were, there were scaffolds around the kitchen, and he, there were boards up near the ceiling. And the cats would walk along, and up there, wow. there, was, there was cat food up there and cat litter up there. And then there was Eugene's stove. And so you'd watch Eugene would be cooking, and the cats would walk by, and bits of litter would fall from, from, the, from the catwalk, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But oh, it was, it was insane. He but, was really generous to me. I never met him, but I've talked to him on the phone a couple uh -huh, of times. Uh -huh. He was very generous to well, me. Well, he was. He, it, it, in the years that that I knew him, he was he was he would give dinner well, dinners, but he he really didn't have any money, and he could not he couldn't buy the ingredients that he wanted to. But but I, I, I he used to love to talk about his apartment in Rome, and he had even in his apartment in. Uh, in his house in, in Mobile, in the backyard, he had pots and pots and pots yeah. with greens and herbs all over. And in Rome, apparently, he had, he had great terraces filled with all kinds of, you know, not just parsley and so on, but a but hundred little greens and things that he'd eat. The, um, Eugene, probably gay, not in, one would think, Craig Claiborne. Every once in a while in your books, there's a, a chef or a writer who is a southerner, and there's a little bit of dissonance. Obviously, not in 2021, but 20, 30, 40 years ago. Is there is there a, a, a is there? A, there aren't a lot of gay chefs in the southeast. Maybe now there are, but I think was that a, was that an issue? Been. Yeah, um, I, I think you know, the if you think about a chef, let's take someone like Bill Neal, um, who in Chapel Hill, uh, in Chapel Hill, yeah. who, you know, I don't want to um, define his sexuality no. because he he um, he defined it in many different ways, but someone like that saw food as a way of expression um, that, you know, for a previous generation might have been rock and roll, like a way to agitate, a way to make change, a way to build your own little liberal army in the woods, like Lou Reed says it, you know, like this was building your own little liberal army in the kitchen. And so you could control that space, you could be who you wanted to be, you know, and that's, you know, the way to connect to someone like Bill Smith, who, was, who just left the kitchen at Crook's Corner. Um, a man who um, um, who is proudly gay and and uh, and an advocate for a new generation of Hispanic immigrants who worked in his kitchen, you know, again he found power in that space in that kitchen space, and then could do what he pleased there, and then step out of that space and make influence. Well, the very the closing two or three chapters of Pot Liquor Papers are interesting. It's the Mexican influence. Mm -hmm. The Southeast Asia, the Vietnamese influence, right. all that is going to come in and, and change, affect Southern foods the way, yeah. you know, it's instead of, instead of uh, uh, an oyster with collards on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> faux oysters Rockefeller, yeah. we're going to have, we're going to have pot liquor that is, uh, um, um, uh, Vietnamese sure. grass. What? Yeah. What's like the lemongrass? Lemongrass. Like lemongrass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a quick question. I'll try to give this a quick answer. This is very strange. We only have one minute left. Okay. All right. Even. All right. We have. This is 
something that bugs me. The America is, or the Southeast especially, is filled with feral pigs. They're tearing up the crops, and apparently they loose, they let loose into the atmosphere enormous amounts of, of CO2. Right. All right, we have more deer than anybody could stand. In Louisiana, there are nutria. And, and I've in, had nutria for dinner once. Don't try. <laughs> well, it's just where we're going. <laughs> and, and in Florida, I went to a lecture a couple of years ago down in Cedar Key about pythons. Mm -hmm. I mean, apparently the damn Everglades are loaded. Right. What about a cookbook You're for invasive me? species? <laughs> um, I mean, I like kudzu <laughs> jelly. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you gave teenage boys rifles and told them to go get all the pigs and all the pythons, if you could figure, I don't think teenage boys should have rifles. <laughs> they, already, they already have rifles. Unless they're out hunting, and then they can share the backstrap with you. Well, kill the boar, kill the deer, kill the nutria, kill the python, and cook it. They're not cooking it. They're just... I have great respect for hunters. That's one of the things I was talking to a friend about yeah. just two nights ago. I wish I had learned to hunt as a boy, but I, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, my father didn't come from hunters. And right. Well, I, I mean, you have books on hamburger, books on apple pie, book, <laughs> French fries, books, Indeed. all kinds of books. But now there's going to be another one. What is the next one? Sure, I'm, I'm working on a book that is memoristic. I, I, uh, I, I um, hesitate to use the term memoir, memoristic. I'm a little more comfortable with that. But it's about my search to belong in the South, and uh -huh. it's about this moment as a, as a white man in the South. What can I contribute? Um, what good can I do? Um, how do I be in the South today? Uh -huh. um, and it uses food as a way to get at those questions. Right. Um, but it's really about kind of stilling that dualism that we hear from so many people. Like, you know, I love the South and I hate the South. Oh, yes. Thompson, <laughs> you know. Um, but I've come to the, the realization that that, that duality um, is maybe not good enough to hold those two ideas in my head that I love this place and at times I hate this place. That that is um, shirking my duties, that I can work toward loving this place and to belong to the South truly, especially in the 21st century, is to love this place despite its flaws, because of its flaws, to recognize its ugliness and embrace its beauty. So that's what I'm trying to work toward. All right. Well, I could not think of a more worthy goal than trying to make it better because it's, it's what, well, it's what we all do more in, in various or ways. less yeah. in various but, but ways. To, to, I really don't want to get to that point where like, I want to make this place better, but I accept what this place is, right? Well, John T., this has been Thank a pleasure. You. My pleasure. Thank you. I, I'm, I hope we can do this again before long. I hope long. so, too. <laughs> I hope so, too. Thank you so much.